good evening. I'm Pastor Linda Mayberry. I'm the executive pastor here at St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. We're very happy to have all of you with us. I have a couple of logistic things to share with you, and then we will begin our, our program for tonight. Uh, the first thing that I would like to share with you is in case of an emergency, and we're not expecting one, but just in case, the two center, the two center aisles here and here, you will go straight out this back door. The aisle over here, you'll go out that door. This aisle over here, you'll go out that door in case of an emergency. Okay. We apologize for the inconvenience of the aroma, but we're having some sewer problems and we're hoping to, by next week, get that all solved. And in the meantime, we again apologize to you for that aroma that you are being uh, subject to tonight. And having said that, let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we indeed thank you for all that you do for us, all that you have done and that you will continue to do. We ask that you spread your anointing across this entire room and that you allow us to do those things that are pleasing in your sight. Pour into the hearts and minds of the listeners, pour into the hearts and the minds of the speakers those things that are according to what you would have us be and do. Knowing that without you, we could do nothing and with you all things are possible. And so we anoint this place at this time, giving you grace, giving you honor and giving you praise. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. I just want to first uh, thank everyone for being here this evening. It's uh, in, in the middle of a summer uh, hot day, and so we know uh, a lot of people made the, a big effort to be here, and we appreciate that. We're uh, very thankful for the opportunity to be here in this beautiful historic church and this historic evening. And so we have with us some very special guests that, uh, that I think we're going to be hearing insights that we don't typically uh, hear we're going to hear personal stories. And so this, as you, as you may know, is the uh, anniversary of Malcolm X's uh, birthday. It would have been 97 today. And so the, the, what we're going to be hearing, the narrative, is really more about him as a person. How, how was his personal experience? And so I think that's an insight that is not usually in the books and in the films that we all see. Um, I'm the founder of the Latino Center for Leadership uh, development uh, and for the Latino Arts Project. The Latino Arts Project is put together this evening as part of our Art Talk series. We have an exhibit that is open at the uh, African American Museum that will be there until the October 31st and we want to welcome everyone there. Um, the exhibit is open every day but Monday so you know, typically the museum had not been open on Sunday so we're open from 11 to 5 um, to give opportunities for families to come and visit. Uh, we talk about freedom, we talk about the slave experience, we talk about the three distinct Afro-Mexican uh, experiences that uh, aren't really well known uh, or not known enough and so I think uh, kind of like the stories we're hearing today, the, the, I guess the similarities are that there's a lot of history that uh, we're told and there's a lot of history that we're not told. And so I think the more we have opportunities to find out, you know, what the truth behind it, we'll find that um, a lot of the communities that have been separated by, uh, by others can find the similarities and find things that we have in commonality that bring us together. And I think tonight is a good example of that. And we're appreciative of the opportunity for, for that to happen. We do have, um, we have a, a booth outside for uh, the, an organization called After 8 to Educate. If you're not familiar with that, that's a shelter for homeless high school students. It's just a few, uh, few miles from here. It's located 
on Grand, East Grand, it's the former uh, Fantasy Harris Elementary School, just on this side of the, of the Cotton Bowl. Um, there's information uh, about the center there. If you, if you, you know, belong to an organization or if you know neighbors that, uh, that are in need of, of social services, particularly youth, um, there are uh, immediate needs that, that can be taken care of there with, uh, when, when you, you have a facility with, with showers for clothing exchange, washer dryer for food insecurities. Uh, there are uh, a, a couple of case managers that are on site there that can help for not just immediate, but you know, medium and long, longer term needs as well. So please spread the word. Um, and you know, if, if you have the, the ability to help financially, you know, you know, all the dollars go directly to services for the kids. And uh, so we appreciate the opportunity for them to be here with us today. Um, so I will, uh, I will have the pleasure right now of introducing uh, my, my friend and my pastor, uh, Richie Butler, um, here at this church. I know that he's going he's gonna to remind you, now that you've been here, you know how to be here and how to get here. So Sunday's just a couple of days away. We look for you to be back. So thank you for being here. Why don't we give it up more, one more time for Jorge Valdor. He is a true leader in, in this community. If there's a problem, he's going to figure out how to solve it. And we thank God for him. He's the, uh, the principal organizer for, for tonight, uh, the Latino uh, Arts Project, Project Unity, and St. Luke sponsoring this evening's event. And I think this is also being um, broadcast on uh, Facebook Live, if I'm not mistaken. So... Welcome to those on Facebook Live. I, I'm Richie Butler, the senior pastor here at St. Luke Community United Methodist Church. There are three things we focus on. We are Christ-centered, which means that we love everybody and no one's excluded. All of God's children are welcome here at St. Luke Community. We're not just Christ-centered. We are kingdom-minded, which means the agenda is bigger than ours. There's something that is far transcendent than us that we're supposed to tap into. And the last thing that we're focused on, and that is justice driven. And I want you to understand that's part of the reason we're here this evening, because Malcolm X was about justice. And so we are glad to be part of hosting uh, this event on this evening. <clears throat> and I just want you to note, you see the stained glass windows in our congregation. They depict the African American diaspora from Africa uh, through the Middle Passage here in the States as slaves moving from slavery uh, to Jim Crow into civil rights. And I want you to know at the very end, you start here and just and go up into the balcony. And when this is over, if you go upstairs and check it out and you travail through our journey to the civil rights, you see Dr. Martin Luther King and it ends with Malcolm X. And so we recognize that God uses all religions, all faiths to get the work done. And so uh, we celebrate and honor him and his work uh, for fighting for justice. So we are so glad and delighted to have you with us this evening and would love for you to come join us on a Sunday if you would like to. All right. No pressure. No pressure. <laughs> so I'm, I'm done with with my remarks. Just want to thank you again. And I want to introduce Someone who also is a freedom fighter, someone who is committed to social justice. Uh, she is a, a doctor, uh, earned doctor. Uh, she is a leader in this community. Uh, she is also someone who has a calling, uh, not just uh, to the streets, but also she has a calling from God. And so we're so grateful to have her in our midst and in this community leading. And most of you know her. Uh, you have seen her out in, on the streets making things happen from the boardroom uh, to the neighborhood community meeting. And that's none other than Dr. Francois Booker Drew, who's going to be our moderator this evening. So without any further ado, I want to introduce the lovely, elegant Dr. Francois Booker Drew. Give it up for Dr. Drew. Thank you. Thank y'all so much for being here tonight. For some reason, I feel like coming to America, and you remember the scene where they're up on stage and he drops the mic and walks off. 
That's something right now that I'm like tempted to do, but I'm not because we're in the church and I'm going to do better. So I am grateful to be here tonight in all seriousness. This is an epic moment. The fact that we are celebrating his 97th birthday and we have two amazing guests with us tonight who are able to share their perspectives as a daughter, as a mentee, as a colleague, to be able to share how they were able to interact, but not only have that interaction, but be impacted by the legacy. What I'm hoping tonight is that you not only listen, but I hope that you walk away thinking about your own legacy and what is it that you are doing to make a difference? Because if one person like a Malcolm X could totally transform and impact the world, what can we do as individuals to do the same thing? But what does that look like for us to work together? And so I hope that you think about what can you do after you leave this service tonight? And so I want to introduce our amazing guest. Thomas Muhammad conceived and co-produced Malcolm X, an overwhelming influence on the black power movement. His other accomplishments include being chair of the National Black United Front's Dallas chapter and co-founder and board vice president of the South Dallas Fair Park Inner City Community Development Corporation. Please give a hand for Thomas Muhammad. And then the lovely Kabila Bahia Shabazz. She is an advocate for social justice. Her life has been shaped by one of the greatest men in history. And today we get to know her and learn about her life growing up and celebrate the birthday of one of the greatest leaders in history, Malcolm X. Please give a, friend, a hand for my new friend. <laughs> So I want to start with asking you about your father. What was it like growing up with Malcolm X? What are your memories? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. I forgot I was wearing a mic. <laughs> um, most people don't understand that um, my father did not bring his rhetoric home with him. Uh, he was a hands-on father. Uh, he was very involved with his uh, children. Um, he was the nurturing parent. Uh, my mother was the disciplinarian. Um, he was always very uh, playful, and it was evident that he, you know, relished his daughters. You know, he would jokingly. Uh, my parents always tried to have a son, and he just kept getting daughters. So he would jokingly say that he had his own little harem at home, you know. So, um, let's see. He was the one that, you know, took us to Carvel for our ice cream cones. He did not take us to the playground, uh, and he would. Uh, make sure he took us to the Catskill Mountains for our, our little weekend vacations. So, um, I know the sweet side of the man. Uh, not everyone uh, is aware that he even had a sweet side. Talk about the ice cream story because I don't think we were talking about that at dinner and I don't think people get a chance to see the human side of who your father was. But talk about the ice cream and what he liked, the vanilla ice cream. <laughs> oh, boy. Uh, let's see. Um, when my father ate ice cream, he did not eat ice cream with us. Uh, it was my mother that served him his ice cream, and it was usually an entire half gallon of vanilla ice cream rather than chocolate. <laughs> You know, um, and he could also eat a half of a watermelon. Wow. Okay. And so I don't think people get a chance to see the human side. Um, they always see the leader and the freedom fighter, and they don't get to see the, the sweet side that you were able to see. Mm, let's see. Uh, he... Uh, I'm glad to say that when he 
uh, was at home, he was able to put his guard down. Uh, I don't think that most uh, black people at that time could even afford to let their guard down when they came out. So it wasn't just my father that had his guard up. Um, that was uh, an inherent armor he wore, and I think all black people wore it when they were out in public. Mm -hmm. I want to ask Thomas a question because we both talked about this last night. And the influence of Marcus Garvey was very apparent in his work. Talk about, and both of you please feel free to chime in, but talk about the influence of Marcus Garvey and who was Marcus Garvey and how that showed up in the work of Malcolm X. Uh, you know, I've always uh, tried to look at the research because that's one of the things that Malcolm always pushed, that you should research for yourself. And by researching for yourself, you learn to think for yourself. And he was a person who did that type of research and shared that with the world. Around him and across the globe. And that was the truth, no matter who it affected. It was all about speaking the truth. And that honesty was something that hit so many people. Me coming out of high school, a Dallas native, I'm coming out of James Madison High, 1966, 16 years old, and <laughs> along with Diane Ragsdale, <laughs> who I <laughs> continued school from elementary to high school, she and I. Uh, but the one thing that sparked us, those of us who were in high school who got recruited in 66 to join SNCC, the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. And in joining SNCC in 1966, for some of you who probably remember, John Lewis, the late John Lewis, the congressman, was our chairman. And we elected Stokely Carmichael. And Stokely, taking the leadership, told us constantly, listen to Malcolm. Listen to Malcolm. And so we grew up listening to Malcolm. And Malcolm always spoke to the issues that were happening at that time like no other leader did. I mean, some would skirt over issues, but Malcolm was always on point. And as a result, many of us were seen as radicals. <laughs> And it was that type of environment. And I mean, I, I hear people all the time, they say, oh, Dallas missed the civil rights movement because the black pastors didn't allow Dr. King to come to town. Well, guess what? Neither did Selma, Alabama. <laughs> but, the, but the key thing is, is that by constantly following Malcolm led us to H. Rap Brown, Muhammad Ali. I mean, Muhammad Ali was my hero. Th thus, my name is Thomas Muhammad Ali, and I tried to, 
used the name Thomas, I'm sorry, Thomas Ali Muhammad, but I tried to use the name Thomas Muhammad Ali, but my sister, who became a Muslim before I did, she said, no, you can't use that name because I have established the name Muhammad for our family. So I became Thomas Ali Muhammad because Muhammad Ali, again, was my hero. When you heard Muhammad Ali, you heard Malcolm. You heard Malcolm. And no one expressed it better than Muhammad Ali. Because if you didn't believe it, he'd beat you up. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just, I'm just, I'm just kidding. But, but in that period, you know, freedom fighting was what we were all about. Whether it's dying rags still, it didn't matter. We, it was what we were all about. Standing up for what is right for black people. And we had every organization in this city that they had across the country. We had SCLC here, NAACP, uh, and other organizations just as they had in other cities across the country. We had them here. Every organization was recruiting. And we don't see a lot of that today, of course. Now, there's Black Lives Matter, but that's like a scattered thing. But young people looking for a place to express their feelings about the system. And we must understand that it's important for us to research. Again, going back to Malcolm, research. And you do the research, you stand up for what is right. And so as a result, uh, getting back to your question, Malcolm taught us to think for ourselves. In other words, as was said by some other leaders, which is very true, and that is, your earlobe is shaped like a question mark, which means it's important to question. And Malcolm pushed that more than anyone else during those times. Kabila, my question for you, thank you, Thomas. My question for you is your father's faith, and it shaped his leadership tremendously. Talk his, about- His faith? Yes. Talk about how that was so central to who he was prior to his trip to Mecca, because I think people focus so much on that trip and the revelation that came from that trip, but there was always the connection to God prior to that. Mm -hmm. Talk about that with your father. Um, my father was always raised in a very religious as well as spiritual household. Um, his father was a minister, although, albeit a radical minister. Um, he had brothers before him that were ministers. Uh, so my father always had a um, deep-rooted faith uh, in God. Um, his... Um, solitary presence while being imprisoned uh, brought him closer to God. Um, he had lost his practice uh, in his faith while he was being a scallywag in the street. Uh, but anyone who believes in God, once they are in a solitary position, will start recommuning with their God. Um, a lot of people are not aware of just how religious uh, my father was. You don't have to be a fanatic in order to be religious. But he was always um, in tune with God, and I think that that is what gave him such a uh, deep sense of self. Thank you. 
My question for both of you is because of your experiences with him, how has that shaped you as a person? What has the relationship and the memories that you have, how has that impacted your life? And Thomas, we can start with you. Well, it's learned, it's taught us that you must be aware at all times the things that are happening around you. Uh, as I was speaking to a good friend the other day, and he uh, was talking about the uh, shooting in Buffalo the other day. And one of the things that we learned from Malcolm in that period and others in the, among leadership at that time was when you go into a place, you read the room. You read the room. So when the program is over or You want to know where everyone was and what they were doing when you walked in the room or when someone else comes in the room. But whenever you go in, read the room. As I always say that, you know, I'm not confused, and I was saying in, in the green room just as we, before we were brought in here, <laughs> Uh, after Emancipation Proclamation was put into law, as an African American, I was never, speaking for my ancestors, asked do you want to remain here or should we send you or can we or do you want us to get you a trip back to Africa? So I, came, I became a citizen by default. Again, I'm speaking for my ancestors. That type of research happens when you learn to appreciate your culture. And that's what Malcolm taught us more than anyone else. We wear, now, African Americans, we wear dashikis, African clothing. That's Malcolm. And you have a whole lot of people, non-Muslims, <laughs> you know, <laughs> again, wearing African garb. That's Malcolm. Kwanzaa created by people following Malcolm. And today, what I think the last count was maybe 60 million people are practicing Kwanzaa, and that includes on the African continent. Africans didn't create that. African Americans created it. And if you, those of you who well, may have been here when we brought M.K. Asante through, who co-produced, or rather produced the movie, The Black Candle, which educates you on the holiday of Kwanzaa, narrated by the late Maya Angelou. And in that movie, one brother said they created Kwanzaa by Kubacharalia, which means self-determination. So I'm saying that Malcolm taught us to love ourselves because you have to love the root. It will teach you 
to love the fruit. That's the importance of learning about yourself and appreciating yourself. So he taught us that and self-defense, for instance, self-determination, and if some of you have seen our film on Malcolm, co-produced by my good friend George Baldor, my Cuban connection, And if you've seen the film, you notice in the film that the story of voting rights comes clear into view because Malcolm was a strong supporter and pusher of voting rights. And he said when he went to Selma, some of you know that, to Selma, Alabama, where he spoke in Selma, if some of you have been to Brown Chapel, Malcolm spoke there before any of the other people you hear about him today. He spoke there. And again, if some of you probably remember, we brought a sister through here, Khadijah, who met Malcolm and Martin Luther King at Brown Chapel because she lived across the street in the projects. And the importance of that is Stokely and others organize and created a place for voter registration that fired up Lowndes County, Alabama. And out of that movement came the Black Panther Party. the Black Panther Party, political party, 1965 in Lowndes County, Alabama. And Huey Newton and Bobby Seale doing monitoring of police conduct in Oakland, California, called Stokely and asked him, can we use the Black Panther up here? Especially when they saw that crouching tiger. And Stokely said yes, because the Black Panther Party belongs to black people. And they became the Black Panther Party for self-defense. Black Panther Party political party, Lowndes County, Alabama. Black Panther Party for self-defense, Oakland, California. And Kathleen Cleaver, and some of you probably were here at church when we brought her through here. I'm sorry, I keep saying we keep bringing, but we believe in bringing history <laughs> to, to connect with people. And so we brought Kathleen Cleaver through here, uh, Eldridge Cleaver's uh, widow. And Kathleen was the one who put together the program Free Huey. And it spread everywhere and Black Panther Party chapters started popping up all over the country. So Malcolm's legacy, that's part of it, the Black Panther Party. That's part of it. Following Malcolm, black people learned about themselves and that's what Malcolm did. Now, of course, we can't leave out Dr. Martin Luther King Jr who in 1956 comes back from Ghana, Africa, and in his speech, in his sermon, he called on Negroes to move to Ghana. This is Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. telling black folk to move to Ghana and help Ghana grow after they had chosen the first president, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, who invited King and other civil rights leaders to Ghana. King comes back 
as a Pan-Africanist before Stokely Carmichael became Kwame Ture. I'm sorry I'm going on with this. <laughs> it's a good history lesson. Thank you. It is. It's a very good history lesson because so many of us don't know all of the information that you're sharing. And so that's powerful for people to be able to see the connection of the Black Panther Party and how Malcolm's legacy spurred that. And even today, we still see how Malcolm's legacy is spurring so many movements. And so you sharing that is impactful and important. So thank you. I want you to talk a little bit about how your dad's legacy has shaped who you are as well. Um, uh, it has shaped me in many ways. Um, one thing that I'm grateful for, uh, being raised by both my parents, um, I noticed growing up, uh, I'm very old, 61, um, Growing up years ago, what I noticed um, among, amongst my uh, peers uh, of my color is that not everyone was comfortable being in their skin. Um, I was always grateful that I did not have an inferiority complex. I had no desire to look like anyone in any way. Um, uh, I never donned a baseball cap in the summer uh, to prevent myself from getting darker. If I got darker, I got darker. Um, I don't straighten my hair, don't have any desire to. Um, and that is one thing that I've always been grateful for. Um, I happen to live in the mountains. My neighbors are predominantly white, but that is uh, because of my love of nature. So uh, in the past, people oftentimes thought that I lived there because I loved whites. However, uh, my white counterparts do not think that I have a desire to be with them, like them at, at all, at all. Um, let's see, but on the other hand, um, being uh, the daughter of uh, my father has made me a bit of an introvert. Um, I don't like the limelight. Uh, I am very low key. Uh, I pass myself off as a chicken farmer quite a few times, um, and people believe it. Uh, but uh, I can say that um, privately, I am honored to be his daughter. Um, I feel blessed that for the most part, he is, um, remembered and um, held in high esteem by most people and those that don't hold him in high esteem. I can understand why and it, you know, that makes me feel good too, actually. Um, um, I wanna thank everyone for remembering him. You know, it does mean a lot. Um, And uh, I'm also grateful that after having lost him, um, over 55 years ago, now I, I still get to hear his voice and not everyone has that. Um, I still get to see him um, on video, not everyone has that. You know, I don't mean to rub that in, but uh, I'm grateful that I have that, you know. 
I will always have his memory because of that. I want to talk to you both about, because you alluded to it, there's a misperception of who he really was. And people think they know the man because they see the pictures of you know, the, him holding the gun at the window. Mm -hmm. And people assume that that was the totality of who he was. And he was so much more that people didn't get to, speak, to see. Yeah. Speak to that and clarify for people okay. how they misperceive who he really was. The picture of him with the uh, shotgun, that was uh, him bearing arms to defend his family. That's when he was give, uh, getting uh, active threats on his life. Um, He was one of the sweetest and kindest people ever. Uh, there were a lot of um, Caucasian anchormen that um, had the same uh, viewpoint of him after having interviewed him, like Mike Wallace and Bill Putel. Uh, you probably don't know these anchormen because of your age. Um, but whites who sat down with him and spoke with him, uh, even the police that were on his um, surveil surveillance detail came away with the same idea that there, he's, it wasn't that he was harmless, he meant no harm. The harm was in his uh, getting black masses to understand that they did not have to uh, live in, in deprecatory ways forever, or if there wasn't a reason to, and there wasn't a reason for them to uh, beg to be treated like human beings. They have the right to be treated as human beings, and they had a right to have a voice against the establishment. And there was no wrong in that. your thoughts? It, 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 it reminds me of something uh, her sister uh, Atala said. Uh, we brought her to town. Here I go again. <laughs> uh, we brought her to town and she spoke and she gave this this answer that just blew me away that someone that young could think that sharp and that showed the uh, discipline that she of course acquired from both Malcolm and her mother Dr. Betty Shabazz and she said the one thing that she learned from her father's being gunned down is that the next time there must be so many leaders that the enemy won't know which way to aim. And uh, that piece uh, was Malcolm stepping up to protect his family. Because, you know, we're encouraging people to get involved, and some of us, many of us, get involved. And when you get involved, that's okay. But when someone or something threatens your family, 
This is a firebomb tossed inside that could have killed his children and his wife. I mean, when you're out here, you can accept anything that comes down, but when someone threatens your family, all bets are off. And yeah, people see him standing in that window with that carbine, and by any means necessary, they can go all day long. But guess what? 1957, or was it six? 55, King's family was threatened also with a firebomb in his home. And what did King do? After settling in his family, he went to the Montgomery Municipal Building and applied for a gun permit. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. applied for a gun permit. Because again, yeah, nonviolence for the community, but my family, all bets are off. Now they turned him down, but he applied because your family is precious. And Malcolm, as you saw in our film, Malcolm got everyone dear to him out of the Audubon ballroom that night. And when they were all safe, friends and family, he stepped up to the podium alone and gave the greetings, as you all know, and he was gunned down. He sacrificed for all of us. He sacrificed for his family and for us. That was a bold brother. He gave his life, as Ossie Davis said in the eulogy our shining black prince. He gave his life for us. So we're gonna open it up for questions at this time from the audience. And so are there any questions? Yes, and how do you, George, how do you want to handle the question segment? Okay. Okay. All right. Good deal. Good. So if you've got questions, please text to the number. So one of the questions that's listed from the audience is, what are the successes and challenges you can share with us being the daughter of an American icon? What expectations are on you as his daughter? You have to repeat the question. I'm not understanding it. So it says, what are the successes and challenges you can share with us being the daughter of an American icon? And what expectations are on you as his daughter? Um, uh, <clears throat> like I uh, stated earlier, um, I do pretty much um, stay in the shadows. Um, it, it does not... Uh, You can't really put uh, my face and my name together. Um, so that is a question that's uh, very difficult for me to answer. Um, it's impossible. It's impossible for me to answer that. It's not that I'm a hermit. 
but I, I uh, live a life um, of relative seclusion. Thank you. The next question Not is. To disappoint. No, you're fine. The next question is, what do you wish everyone listening to you right now and everyone would do beginning today? And that's for both of you. And I'll read it again. What do you wish everyone listening to you right now and everyone would do beginning today? Was that a question for me as well? Mm -hmm. That's for both of y'all. Uh, they, for both people of need to um, uh, take their lives more seriously and uh, do a lot of self, uh, soul searching and start loving themselves. And the question again was? The question was, what do you wish everyone listening to you right now and everyone would do beginning today? What do you think people should be doing after listening to this? What's the next step for them? Research. Research. Uh, that's extremely important because again, research It's like, that's one of the things that I remember uh, that was an awesome answer to a question uh, when we were in, uh, at a forum in Selma, Alabama, uh, as I serve on the National Voting Rights Museum uh, board uh, in Selma. And we sponsored a program and uh, Ed Gordon, if some of you probably remember from uh, Ed Gordon, I think, uh, well, he was for BET and then mm -hmm. at that time BET and uh, other different stations. But uh, we had a forum and questions came up about affirmative action. Uh, and when I was uh, noticed to ask the question, I uh, introduced the subject of slave reparations. And uh, Ed, uh, after entertaining answers from different other people in the forum, Hank Sanders, you know, one of the founders of our museum in Selma, a prominent attorney, state representative uh, in the legislature there, first African-American legislature, uh, I mean legislator in Selma, Alabama, and at a law firm, uh, Sanders uh, Law Firm, and Hank said what he loved about reparations is not about the money. He said he loved the issue of reparation because it will force African Americans, black folks, to learn about themselves. And that hit me like a ton of bricks, because it's true. In order to get paid, you got to prove that you, <laughs> that you deserve this money because of your slavery in your, in your family or what have you. And it will take you back to Africa researching slavery. Imagine homeboy and them sitting out on the corners out here with the 40 ounces tilted up, having, forcing them to learn about themselves. Believe you me, I do believe 
they were put down to be in wine. And wouldn't that be a bountiful thing for, this, for black communities <laughs> across this country? I mean, come on. Learn about themselves, that pride of who you are, where you come from. Malcolm came of, from a family of Garveyites. His parents were Garveyites, Marcus Garvey. And as a result of being a Garveyite, learning about loving your people. Remember Garvey was organizing people to take them back to Africa. And Malcolm, a child, learning that. That's Malcolm going door to door, selling the Garvey newspaper understanding the importance of communication with your people. So when he joined the Nation of Islam, created the Muhammad Speaks newspaper. That's Malcolm. And even today, you still see brothers on the corner with those papers. That's Malcolm. And as a result, You see people learning to love themselves once they learn where they are, who they are, where they come from. And so Malcolm, like a number of families without a man in the house, okay, ends up in prison. His father killed by the Klan his mother in an insane asylum. And he grows up without a father. Ends up in prison. And his family, his brother and his sister, his brothers, four of them, ministers in the nation of Islam, Malcolm comes out of prison and run past them and became the first spokesman for the Nation of Islam. But here's another thing about that. That seed had already been planted by the Garvey movement. And his brothers and his sisters convinced him to join the Nation of Islam while he was in prison because they told him, this is what we grew up with. It was something like what we grew up with. His mother spoke four languages, my understanding. And she was the editor for some of the Garvey papers. His mother. So Malcolm grew up, and that seed had been planted. He comes out, run past everyone in the nation, becomes the first spokesman. And when he's on the East Coast, Recruiting, 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 or fishing as they call it. And he took the nation of Islam from 300 members to 300,000. That's Malcolm. Work, 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 study, learn for yourself. He did that. And so it tells us that if he could do it, any of us could do it. And I'm not saying that you should join the Nation of Islam, because I was never in there. My sister was. I wasn't. But still, the work that he did, Malcolm, teaches us we can do it as well for our people. We have to. Turn, help them turn their lives around. I want to say thank you to oh. both of you. 
because this was awesome. I'm gonna brag, I had the opportunity to spend some time with them last night and in the green room and the stories are amazing. And you all just got a glimpse of the brilliance um, of both of these amazing human beings and they are phenomenal people. And you, I just wanna brag, you just got to see this much because their contributions are amazing. So I wanna say thank you both for being here tonight. I also wanna make sure that we give you a gift for your visit here. And so there is a local artist by the name of Ebony Lewis. And Ebony actually painted something for you today. And so is Ebony in the audience so that we can recognize her and raise, raise her hand? She had to leave, so I want to show this to the audience. But this is what Ebony did. And so, thank you. This is our gift to you. Thank you for being a light and continuing the legacy of your amazing father. We are so grateful that you came and spent some time with us. So thank you. Give them a hand oh, again. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so we want everyone to remain seated until our guest leaves and then we will have you exit the building. Okay. So anything that you want to say, George, before we close out the program? I will give you a call, okay? Thank you. All right. Mr. Muhammad. <laughs>